I am Dana Nelson. I'm chair of the English department, and I've been on the TIPS Council now for four years. And I'm just going to ad lib here and say that it's something I really enjoy. It's been one of my favorite committees in my 15 years at Vanderbilt. Um, I feel really honored to have been invited to be part of this process. Um, so I'm here to welcome you to the TIPS proposal development session. Um, it's a kind of long process we subject our applicants to, and I want to congratulate you on having navigated the pre-proposal stage. Um, today's event is designed to provide you with information that you can use to develop your full proposal, and we're hoping to accomplish this through a set of short panel discussions and then um, an extended informal question and answer session. So in a few moments, I'll be joined by our first panelist, TIPS, my fellow TIPS Council member, Doug Adams, and a TIPS Review Panel member, David Calkins, to talk about the kinds of things we look for on the council and in the uh, committees as we review proposals. Um, we'll discuss some of the most important aspects of the proposal and try to convey the things that we think go into winning proposals. Our second panel will feature faculty members who successfully navigated the TIPS application process and are helping to manage currently funded projects. So they'll provide um, their perspective as they sat in your shoes last year. The final panel will feature faculty members who are associated with some of Vanderbilt's established trans-institutional centers and institutes. And so they'll be able to talk with you about some of the things they're doing to sustain success on campus, such as relationship building, identifying and uh, pursuing internal and external funding resources, and growing a collaborative community of interdisciplinary scholars. So we'll wrap up the event with an informal Q&A session, um, and the panelists will be in the room. You'll have an opportunity to approach them and ask specific questions if if that works better for you. So without further ado, let me invite Doug and David to join me and get things started. I don't know who's going first. Christian, do, do they know? <laughs> oh, Doug. OK. Well. It's good to see everybody. Uh, and like Dana said, it's a privilege. I think every time I open a proposal, I'm reminded of what a privilege it is to read, uh, to read these very creative proposals. OK, so we were asked to talk about uh, ways in which proposals kind of rise to the top in the process of reviewing. And of course, like Dana described, we get the benefit of, of having the, the panelists across the campus reviewing uh, TIPS proposals before the TIPS Council uh, colleagues uh, like David, uh, uh, share with us their, their reviews, and, and uh, that is incredibly helpful to the TIPS Council. And I think uh, when I think about proposals that rise to the top, I think you wouldn't be surprised that, that ones that rise to the top are ones that inspire um, everybody, the panelists, the, the council members. Um, but I think what makes the, the process of TIPS a little different is that these are proposals that don't just inspire maybe you in a discipline, they inspire everybody around the table. Uh, and I, I think those are very special kinds of stories. Uh, and so being able to convey it to a non-expert is something that I think makes the TIPS process uh, very exciting and, and a great opportunity at Vanderbilt. In education, likewise, a proposal that makes us all wish we were students who are a part of this effort, uh, you know, the unique experiences that it offers <coughs> students, uh, the immersion experience, it's an immersion experience, yes, but how is that unique? How is that going to offer a Vanderbilt student something different <coughs> than any other student on any other campus across the country? Uh, and, and something that's truly integrative, um, as opposed to maybe an educational experience <coughs> that, okay, we need education, so we'll add that uh, as a part of the, the program. No, it's a, it's a part of the discovery process, and it's truly integrative, is something that uh, I think the TIPS, TIPS proposals that do that really uh, are reviewed favorably. Uh, and, and I think one other aspect of TIPS uh, uh, proposals that uh, receive really positive reviews, I think all these proposals in some sense are, you automatically get the sense that they're, they, they are interdisciplinary, but not assuming that that's obvious and kind of describing, well, this is a societal challenge and the reason that we have to come together to solve this challenge or address these set of 
uh, uh, barriers is because uh, we have to have these three disciplines addressing this challenge in this way. Again, these are not all experts in all areas, and so being able to articulate why it's truly transdisciplinary, dis not just in the names that are on the proposals, but in the spirit of the work that's being done is, is really important. And then finally, I think the other aspect of TIPS is it's a launching pad for preeminence and preeminent programs, centers, and institutes. And so I think uh, walking away with a feeling that either this is a, a program that's, that's kind of on its way to helping put Vanderbilt on the map, or it, it, it very much is a program that you can imagine, you know, uh, five years, ten years down the road, well, Vanderbilt could, could really have a, a place nationally and internationally because this program will have been supported uh, is something that, that uh, you know, I think we'd all like to see. Those are my thoughts. Those are great thoughts. Thank you, David. You're very welcome. Thank you. I'm Dave Calkins. I am the director of the Vanderbilt Vision Research Center, which is a trans-institutional now and <coughs> interdepartmental program at Vanderbilt. We've got about 50 faculty or so uh, studying the visual system from different aspects, and I direct that offer. But I'm also the vice chairman, director for research of the Vanderbilt Eye Institute and Department of Ophthalmology, which is a big clinical department in the medical center. And so uh, for me, being able to participate in the TIPS program now since its inception, I think four years ago, mm -hmm. um, has, has really been refreshing for me because it, it, it tears me away from uh, the world that I'm used to in terms of grants and proposals and, and puts me into something that I think is bigger. And that's where I would like to start. Big ideas, transformative ideas, transcendent ideas. I am the chair of a National Institutes of Health study section, which meets three times a year in Washington, D.C. to review scientific proposals. I also sit on review panels for um, many private foundations, can, uh, including the Whitaker Foundation, which funds engineering grants, and also the National Science Foundation. And if I see a proposal that would be considered appropriate for one of those very highly focused, siloed panels, then I don't score it well, because it should be going to one of those panels. And so what I see very often in, in the less successful TIPS proposals are proposals that really are, well, look, I, I need this for my laboratory or I need this for my department, and so this is a grant that didn't do too well, so I'm going to spin it a little bit and, and put it into TIPS. And that's very, very transparent. And you can see, you'll notice that for those kinds of proposals, the educational aspects um, are really throw-ins. And, and you can see that it's a throw-in. And they'll you know, take a nod off to underrepresented minorities sometimes. They'll take a hat off to international uh, global health issues and things like that. And they don't do so well. And so I think when you, when you write your proposal, you really have to challenge yourself <coughs> to think outside the, your comfort zone and ask yourself, what is the bigger value, the value added, of the idea that I am proposing? And is it truly going to be transcendent or transformative? And is it truly a big idea? And finally, if you put a team together of uh, different experts across different departments, institutions, make certain that your proposal spells out in no uncertain terms what their roles are so that we can see they're not just throw-ins or, or a hat off to, to, to interdisciplinary work. And I think that that is really, really, really key. There has to be a path forward and there has to be tangibles in the proposal that are easy to detect and the value of the links between those tangibles ought to be apparent. And I think I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, Krishna, may I ask you, can we do, we're, we're saving all the Q&A for the end? Um, if you guys want to open it up. Let's do it. Let's do Because we've got a few minutes in our 20 minute segment. So if anybody has specific questions to direct to David or Doug or me, I'm happy for questions too. For the educational component, does it need to be specific to students, <coughs> medical students or graduate students, or what about community involvement in education and patients? I have seen successful proposals that involve all of those things that, that you've mentioned, as long as the greater value is, is made clear. 
And some of the best ones that we've scored have actually involved community education. Make sure it's not a tack on though. When, oh yeah, we'll invite somebody through a website to come. And I would just underscore, I mean, the most successful proposals are proposals that are really worked through at every level. When things are tacked on, we see them as tacked on, and we go after that. And, and you will have gotten some of that feedback in the pre-proposal stage. Um, the proposals that succeed are the ones that, as Doug put it, tell a great story. And to tell that story, you really have to think of you know, what you're narrating to people who don't automatically get any part of it. Um, but if, if you can do that and you work through all the parts of it, I think it puts you in much better standing um, in the eyes of the committee. And if you're not excited, then it's not exciting. Mm -hmm. Are you going to discuss the, um, the scores of the reviews and um, like thinking about incorporating feedback, how how much do you stay true to the pre-proposal and how much can you change to accommodate feedback? You can change it a lot. Yeah. And we give you that feedback for a reason. And you know, lots of times we see germs of things that we really like in the pre-proposal, um, but we can see, for instance, that the, the people proposing it haven't really taken advantage of the full array of resources at Vanderbilt, that they're proposing something that is genuinely, excitingly interdisciplinary and they haven't even brought all the resources on board yet. So yeah, change it a lot. Get those people on board. Think it through together. I don't, you know, I, I don't think any of us are saying it shouldn't change a lot. We're offering you an opportunity to really build it out between the pre-proposal and the proposal. Go ahead. Uh, so some of the feedback that uh, I have received was a concern about an assistant professor leading the project. Mm -hmm. So I happen to be the lead person and I am an assistant professor. Um, and so, of course, um, I wanted to address that feedback and so, you know, trying to find perhaps some more senior folks. Do you guys have perspectives or um, advice on how to go about, you know, finding um, people that would be, you know, interested in your project or in your learning. You know, so I've, I've seen that and I don't have any problem scoring a proposal high with an assistant professor uh, so long as what is being proposed is consistent with that career trajectory, right? You're not stepping outside of, of your, your own realm. But in terms of finding people who um, can help you that you know you have you have to ask around and just again make sure it's not just a attack on make sure that role is, is specifically addressed in the proposal. Yeah, and I, I think people in the tips council are happy. I mean, I, if, if you ask us for more specific feedback, I'm sure we can provide ways I'm looking at John here um, to get you in touch with people who we think can help you build a <coughs> proposal and kind of fully utilize Vanderbilt. I, I wasn't one of the readers on your pre-proposal, so I don't have it at the top of my head, and I can't respond off the cuff. But I know we can find people who did and can give you better answers. I'd also say, <coughs> you know, you're back here just uh, parking away, but um, in that particular case for the assistant professor, as David indicated, you want it to be consistent with the program research, and you certainly just don't want to add somebody for that sake. But another part of it is that you could have a dean or a chair write a letter to be part of the package saying, look, this is exactly what this individual should be doing. Yeah. And it's not something that threatens that's the prospects for tenure. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's the thing that the council's most sensitive about. It isn't that somebody's junior and therefore not capable of the work. In fact, quite the contrary. It's more that we're putting that person's career at risk because we know the clock ticks. And, ticks and if you get a big us. grant like this, then you're spending lots of time administrating it. Right. But also, but conversely, how the, how the grant would help your career. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thinking, thinking uh, about your career and, and how you can assemble, <laughs> you know, probably assemble a team around you from a career standpoint, but also the program standpoint is a piece of it. Yeah. I'm just thinking about how, like, I just don't know of any other university that has this, this is so amazing to be able to learn to be supported in this way to be able to learn as it's like a big you know um 
the whole university is learning together. Like yeah. I just haven't seen this before, and this is why it was so so attractive <clears throat> to me to be able to you know collaborate with somebody in the music school or whatever you yeah. know mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. like a project that you're passionate about. I just haven't seen it at another university. That's why people stay. <laughs> it's really true. It is true. Um, we didn't, our proposal actually did not get very much feedback at all. Um, and I mean, amongst ourselves, we were kind of like, how did we even get to the next level? <laughs> because, we, you know, it was really hard to read what the thoughts were. Mm -hmm. So, who should I contact you uh, to get <coughs> more feedback? I or? think you can contact any of us. I think you can contact um, Christian or Skylar or Sally, and we'll get yeah. together and come back with you might have Sally. a problem with Fountain <coughs> because he had some really good feedback. Who? Robin Fountain. Christian, are you in the name right? Yeah, no, you got it right. right. Yes. So yep. He had some good feedback yeah. and He's really very seemed to know what that greater mission and vision was. Uh -huh. And so I would reach out to him yes. directly. And I would like to just say that we do not just read these proposals skeptically. Um, and there are any number of moments where the actual readers of the pre-proposals will not rate it very highly. And somebody else at the table will say, I know the people working on this. Let me tell you. And then they'll persuade us the proposal goes forward. Um, so we, we actually really do read these proposals creatively and supportively. And if you don't have the level of feedback that you want, checking back us. with us okay. and asking us whom to contact is a really great move. Because it may well be that the people who read your proposal weren't totally getting it, but other people at the table did. Yeah. And those other people, I, I said at the last meeting more than once, you should have been, you should have been writing all that down to give back to those people for feedback because that will help them make a successful proposal. When you're reviewing a proposal, silence is deafening. And so when I write very little, it's simply because I didn't get excited. And yeah, so what I would what do, I and that's, that's that's what your intuition is telling Your intuition yeah. is telling you is that something is a muck, yes? Yes. Yes, exactly. That, that people didn't understand or something. So, so take a critical yeah. take a critical eye to it and say, is this have I excited the reviewer? Is this exciting? Am I excited? And and contact. Yeah, generally yeah. just you could reach back out to that tips at email, which was Scarlett Turin, and she can help you, she can help, she one, give you some of the feedback that, you know, that was in the meeting, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And, and two, you want that if she thinks there's someone that you might connect with who, who would be more appropriate to give you some additional feedback, she can help you in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And I assume that offer goes for all. Of course, mm -hmm. that's why it's everybody's at email, yeah. It's yeah. the email that you got your Okay, so should we call this and move on to the next panel, which is um, Seth Gordonstein and Tara McKay. Oh, don't take mine. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> So, on to panel two with people who succeeded last year in nailing down one of these. And I don't know which of you is designated yeah, as first. first, so. yeah, sure. first. Okay, so uh, how many of you are TIPS applicants this year? Most of you? And how many of you are moving on to the, to the full stage? Okay. Most of you, okay. Um, I say that because I've gone through the TIPS process three times, so I know what it's like to get to the pre-reject or go to the full, then get rejected, and then go to the pre again, go to the full again, and get rejected, and then ultimately uh, uh, get it funded. And so persistence is a factor in all of this as well. Um, yeah. Appreciate it. So I'm Professor Seth Bordenstein of the Biological Sciences Department, and I direct the Vanderbilt Microbiome Initiative. Um, and this, is a, this, is a, this goal is to blend Vanderbilt's basic translational <laughs> clinical endeavors into a world-class research and education enterprise on the microbiome uh, and the various disciplines that contribute to that. So the microbiome is just 
all the microbes that live in and on our bodies or any animal or plant, etc. Um, and it's gone through a few years of twists and turns. I'd like to give you a, the scope of what I, what I was experiencing during this three-year process. So what was it like to bring in diverse groups? You've probably all gone through this by now, and I think it's pretty easy to bring in diverse groups. Um, across the campus, there's a lot of enthusiasm for the TIPS program. So I think Vanderbilt's values shine through this process as soon as you send an email to contact somebody. You usually get a positive response, okay? So that's exciting that it's seen throughout the campus. Um, so what stood out in the proposal that made it successful? Ultimately, it was, as already said, trans institutionality. And I also think team commitment has to be clear and evident to the council. Um, because some of the things that were positive throughout our, our reviews were, were uh, you know, this team is clearly involved in this area of research. And so I, I take it that they valued seeing that. And if there were any uh, potential risks in not seeing that, I suppose that would, would not be viewed favorably. Um, so build from various players around the campus, but make sure the team that gets built is not brittle and that it has clear focus and drive and that these are players in this area as well as players outside the area that want to come and join, join the initiative. Um, by the third time, I think they, they said, I can't remember why we have not funded this yet. So that was <laughs> nice to go through that process and hear that. Um, what would I do differently? Uh, when you go to the full proposal, you have to have an itemized budget. Um, I think mine was itemized according to categories with numbers, but go the full distance. There's a space box there for you to outline exactly how you're going to use your dollars and use that space box to your fullest advantage so there's no question about where your money is going because this is evaluated uh, in the process. That is really true. <clears throat> and then uh, also what I would do differently is uh, during, while I have while I have this program now, I wish I had also said the things that I'm doing now that I wasn't doing while I had the, while I had the application in front of me, right? So um, advertise this. Use the campus's media outlets in order to tell folks what you're doing while it's happening and say that you'll include that as part of your tips proposal, right? So invent a Facebook page or Twitter stream, but also get Vanderbilt News involved to advertise what's going on. And I've started to see some of that this year already, and I think that's a positive way to spread a current tips proposal in the application stage or currently and bring in more people that way. <clears throat> um, is it hard to get off the ground as, now that I've got the money? Not really. So once we had the money, I was enthusiastic about how to start this initiative. There was a breath of fresh air, you know, so finally we can do this, and it was off and running. And I think the thing that I've learned through this process is I've sort of been motivated by creating new things that weren't in the original application. So there are things that have come up impromptu. For me, it's been a training workshop to train uh, bioinformatics related to the microbiome <coughs> across the campus, and we're going to do this multiple times. And that wasn't in my original proposal, but uh, it just is apparent that there's a need across the campus for this, and that this is the great, perfect initiative to match that need. Um, and then uh, involve undergrads. So this is obvious, but we are you know, proposing to do undergraduate research in our application, and we clearly outline that. And we propose for them to get involved in computer engineering and creating an app that supports our microbiome research. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I didn't write in that I should have and that we did this year was in my class, I offered the opportunity to undergrads to get involved in Vanderbilt's first clinical microbiome trial. Um, and so uh, I believe there are several undergraduates now participating in the research that we we're advertising and promoting in our tips proposal as is. And so this is a really multi-layered way, uh, multi way of getting the uh, undergraduates involved. I think I can leave it at that point. Great. Excellent. Hi, I am Tara McKay. I'm in the Center for Medicine, Health, and Society, um, and I'm a sociologist. Um, and like Seth, um, I think my the project that I'm on actually started out with a failed proposal as well. Um, so when I kind of first started here, there was some moti like motivation among um, a few senior people in sociology and economics and Peabody uh, to bring in uh, or to uh, create some intellectual community around population studies and demography. And um, so I was one of the junior people that they brought in as a participant on like creating that proposal. Um, and that proposal involved um, 
three or four uh, primary research projects driven by faculty that were disparate in terms of what they were actually attending to. So one was in education, one was in health, one was in uh, other kind of uh, social inequality and policy processes. Um, and that was ultimately not funded, right? Because it was primarily driving some of like, some of the, like in response to some of these comments about how we're not here to just fund projects that could otherwise be funded by other mechanisms, right? That feedback was, I think, heard very loud and clear. Um, and But out of that, um, a few things happened. So one of those projects was an an LGBT project uh, related to the effects of policies on health. Um, there are a few of us in that initial like population studies group who uh, had expertise and interest in moving that forward. Um, and we kind of uh, <coughs> now had this critical mass of faculty across, um, across schools that could do some of this work. Um, we had a preformed group and network that was that already uh, had some motivation to work together regardless. We had submitted other foundation grant proposals um, and it looked like we were in the running for that. Ultimately that did get funding and so was able to move the research along. Um, and so when we put together this TIPS pro uh, proposal for the LGBT Policy Lab, uh, we didn't have to kind of, uh, we had a good strong foundation for that. We had the research funding piece already that didn't need to be included in um, this uh, tips piece and um, we were able to kind of use that money then to or the budget then to think about other ways that we could engage with the campus and engage with students um, and provide other smaller like uh, uh, pockets of money for research support for uh, grad students and undergraduate students to engage in some of that research. Um, and so that LGBT Policy Lab uh, project ultimately fund is going to fund a postdoc uh, for two years um, and uh, also some of these smaller grants and awards, a colloquium to kind of engage people around the campus on some of these issues. We have um, brought in people from Peabody and law and political science um, in addition to our initial team of three, uh, which was the team that put together the pre-proposal. Um, and one of our like uh, biggest pieces of feedback on the pre-proposal was get more people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was actually kind of difficult because work like there aren't actually like you know just finding people who are going to engage with LGBT policies or other uh, policies related to gender and sexuality is ju is just a little more difficult around campus. But ultimately, we found um, we now have this proposal of 11 people, um, and I do I don't think they were. Uh, you know, just add on, tack on people. I think we made a good case for why these were the right people um, and really spent a good uh, month, like December in that January period where you know what's, like, you're putting this together, really networking and trying to, con like, engage with people around uh, what they would uh, contribute to this project. Um, so we did spend a lot of time really building out the right people. We included people from law since this was a policy project um, and proposal. That was like key uh, feedback that we got. Like you need people in who are also working on policy besides the economist, the sociologist, and a health policy person. Um, and all that also drove um, the inclusion of political scientists as well. Um, and then thinking over some of um, David and Doug's comments around like what makes this exciting, we actually spent uh, three quarters of the page of that proposal on what this policy lab is going to bring to Vanderbilt, why that's not novel, reviewing other kind of related or similar centers at a few other universities and how we were actually different. Um, and then we spent about two-thirds of a page on our sustainability plan, like what our funding might look like in the future, what kinds of things that might set us up well to do later. Um, and in relation to the roles, uh, like in terms of all of these new people we've added, we spent about a page actually detailing why these were the right people. Um, so I think those things uh, played out well, ultimately. Um, uh, we were also asked to kind of indicate a few like challenges in terms of getting things started. Um, and so the one kind of thing that uh, had come out of our project once it was funded, uh, I mentioned this money was for, or a lot of the money was going to a postdoc. Um, well, when you find out that you're hiring a postdoc in April, May, or June, hiring a postdoc in April, May, or June is hard. <laughs> um, so we ultimately kind of worked with the TIPS um, 
uh, group to uh, and um, uh, <coughs> other executive people there to uh, push back the timing of that hire because we got one good applicant who was fine, but we weren't super excited about in terms of what they were going to bring to uh, the project. And so we're now doing that search right now as a first year and pushed most of our like spending on that project for um, you know, the following academic year and the year after. So we actually just pushed the timeline by a year. Um, so I think that's been an important thing to think through. Like if having a graduate student or postdoc involved in some of these projects is important to you um, and your proposal, then figuring out how you're going to find them and um, pay for them in the interim, uh, I think is maybe worthwhile uh, to spend a few minutes thinking about. So we have a few minutes before our 20 is up. Anybody have any questions for the panelists? struggle with a little bit is um, actually drafting the proposal is very different um, than drafting like a, a an NIH grant or something like that in terms of the you know it's that other grant is sort of like an NIH grant is driven by your specific aims and very very specific and so I guess I have a little bit of a hard time um, <coughs> stepping away from that model and so I uh, so I guess my question would be Certainly, you want to be specific about what you intend to do and how you intend to do it. But um, but so many of these other components of the application <coughs> are just as, if not more important, in terms of the transinstitutional nature and making it very integrated and things like that. So I guess, do you guys have any suggestions for um, how to strike the right balance between science and methods and specifics and sort of the bigger the bigger picture under that umbrella of the transinstitutional nature? Uh, yeah, as a, as a scientist, I thought this was sort of the opposite of how I'd go about writing a grant, right? So it's the bulk of it is on the vision and how it can all come together rather than the mechanics of how you're going to operate that vision, um, at least in, in a, a science proposal. Because if I start outlining the methods of, you know, how we're collecting samples and how we're sequencing them, I think that's just not going to hit the right core. It's going to waste precious space in order to describe why this is a trans-institutional endeavor. Um, so I think you've got to flip it a little bit on its head <coughs> in that regard. Um, maybe you can offer which are the specific sections you're referring to in this regard to give a little bit more specific answer. But um, <clears throat> really, it's just I, I feel like the panel has given sort of great advice on how to um, how to kind of capture the spirit of the program in the application. But it's just I, I just struggle with in the actual one you're proposing how you're going to accomplish it. You know, because we we did get a one comment on our proposal that it's unclear how you're going to carry these out. Like, you need to be a little bit more specific about mm -hmm. what that is. Yeah. But I'm like, how, how specific do we need to get? I'm used to being super specific, and then I'm just having a hard time envisioning how specific it is in terms of the, the, the analytical methods and the, you know, the laboratory methods. I, I, think I think that's more a question for the strategy. <laughs> it's the strategy. Um, yeah. Not the method, it's the strategy. Mm -hmm. yeah. do, you have, do you have an answer to that question? How am I going? What is my path forward from A to B to C? And if you can make that clear, the details are not, not sorry. We know you know the details. Mm -hmm. That's a game. You're here, right? So we got that. But if you say, oh, I, I'm, I want to get to C, and here's what we're going to do once we get to C, but you don't tell us how you got there, then that's a, that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. Ed? Ed? I'm going to do my homework, but are we allowed to include collaborative letters or letters of uh, endorsement? So, for example, we organize an undergraduate program that involves several departments. Mm -hmm. Should we not have the chair of that department and say that he or she agrees with this or is in favor of this? Is that possible to include such? You can include them. People telling us they agree with your project or support your project is not very helpful information. If they can descriptively convey how it adds value to their program, that's useful. Um, just telling us that they like it and they like you and they're appreciative, that's just blah, 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 that doesn't help yeah, us. I have in mind something like you're, you're teaching a course, you develop a course, it's taught jointly, it's focused, you know, a certain focus, 
say someone from that department, like an administrative person, the chair, <coughs> to endorse it? If they endorse it descriptively, I would say that that's helpful. If they're just telling us they endorse it, maybe a little bit of information, but not. Yeah, how they endorse it. Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, again, and this, this goes to the question about being really specific about the science. Um, and, and I'll return to Doug's comment about the story. I mean, you're, it, it, imagine pitching this in the grocery store to somebody in the produce, produce aisle, right? Um, you, you, you imagine that you're talking to intelligent people who don't get what you do, and you're trying to get them excited about it. Um, and, and so, you know, people from many different disciplines are going to be reading this, and you want them all excited. Um, and that's why I'm saying, just I endorse doesn't help us get excited, but this has been, you know, incredibly valuable for our undergraduate students learning about X, Y, and Z. That helps. Um, and so sometimes it just, you know, sometimes it is useful to hear about your program through somebody else's lens. In the same way, it's the same work we do for each other at these committee meetings. <coughs> somebody can stand in and say, okay, well, they didn't describe that very well, but let me take a whack at it because. I get it. So if, if somebody's offering you that kind of an endorsement, you know, here's why it's helpful, here's the value that it's added for our program, that's useful. Yeah, it, one of the things that I think we've heard in review was, you know, what's the legacy for Vanderbilt as, as one of the overarching principles for, for the TIPS program? So speak to that more so than how you're going to do it the science because we're all competent at doing that and I think the team will take care of that in itself. But also having a transdisciplinary team will I think also bring this back to somewhat of a general description rather than a specific description because there may not be nine biologists on the program, there may be a few, <coughs> a few others that are outside of it that should understand the, the force behind the vision and the legacy. <clears throat> and as Tara said, if there are other programs at other institutions doing similar things, it's very useful for us, A, to know that, but also B, to know what will distinguish your program from theirs. Um, because it's really easy to say, oh, well, there are programs just like this at Johns Hopkins and Cornell, and, and then if you haven't said what value your program adds in that national context, we don't have any way of knowing that. And by the same token, how does it bring val value to Vanderbilt? We take both of those things very seriously. How will it establish our institutional preeminence? But also, how will it ferment something new here and draw in even more faculty than might currently be involved? Does that help? Go ahead. I just have a, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the sustainability piece that you put in there, because some of these are really big ideas, but the money is limited, there's a, you said 11 people on your so did you actually talk about how, you know, what sources of funding you're going to continue the project with? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we do <coughs> identify a couple of potential outlets for, uh, or uh, mechanisms for future funding um, and uh, kind of ways that we can build this out a little bit more institutionally in terms of Vanderbilt specifically. So um, one of the pieces is also developing an LGBT health and policy course, right, that will be, uh, you know, a stable course that's then offered. Um, and so giving it some of that uh, kind of space and longevity, even, um, you know, depending on how funding stuff works out, right, that can always be timing related. Um, but to also have it have a presence here. Yeah, that's some of the things we included. A question about the budget. Is there a, would you say that uh, there's a, a healthy balance uh, that we need to strike between how much money we budget for the educational component versus the research component? Um, do you have any advice on that? As far as my experience goes, I, I, I didn't have a lot of context to decide that, but <clears throat> I wasn't targeting an equal division that just was what the project demanded in order for us to accomplish it. So again, based on the vision and the legacy and then the budget kind of sorts itself out after that. Um, some things we can do on the cheap, right? If undergraduate research in the lab, <coughs> we're not funding an undergraduate, they're just participating in laboratory research, so that's not something on the books. Or having undergraduates participate in a clinical microbiome study, <clears throat> it's the research clinical microbiome study that's funding the undergraduate participation. So 
in some sense, the, there's overlap there, but I wouldn't write an education section that says we're funding undergraduates because it didn't cost us anything to do that. <clears throat> yeah, and I think to the extent that you could that you could talk about the budget in the same way you talk about the story of, of integrating discovery and learning, I think it would benefit both of those pieces of the puzzle <coughs> because if you have kind of separate compartmentalized budget categories, it it kind of compartmentalizes your proposal in a way. Whereas if you have undergraduates participating in the way I think that 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 you just the panelists described. You know, they're a part of the research, you know, they're conducting their, their, their subjects in the research or they're out there, you know, doing field research. I think it, it really brings the, the discovery and learning pieces together, so. And I, I'm gonna want. close it here so we can move on to our third panel, but to just summarize an answer, I don't think there's any formula. We want a digested budget in the same way that we want a digested proposal. So we need the budget to make sense for what you're proposing. We red flag things that don't look carefully thought out. Um, so as long as the budget's really integrated with the vision for what you're doing, we're good with that. If you've thrown things in that look ill-considered or just formulaic, that's what gets our attention. So I would say ask for the budget that you think you need to do to do your project. I've never once heard any of my fellow council members doing something like, oh, this person is asking for this much and this and this much and this, and isn't that a problem? It's always about the specific way the budget ask is happening. Um, so we're going to move on to our third panel now. Thank you to our second panelist, and congratulations again. I was fun hearing that story. I hadn't even put those two proposals together. Yeah. So that was, that was really fun to hear. Thanks. So panel number three. And my apologies, Avery, if I mispronounced Dickens de Giron. Giron. <laughs> okay. Um, George Hornberger and Liz Zeichmeister. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm Avery Dickens de Giron. I'm the executive director of the Center for Latin American Studies, and uh, we've been around since 1947. And as an interdisciplinary center, the trans-institutional work is just part of our core mission. So it's something that we've been doing for a long time. Today we have 140, over 140 affiliated faculty from across all of Vanderbilt schools and colleges. And we spend a lot of time building relationships between our faculty. And so that's what I'm going to talk about as part of the panel relationship building. So we make it our job at class to know everybody on campus who is doing research or who is a teaching or conducting service work in Latin America. And so, of course, this takes a lot of time and involves lot, lots of different meetings, um, getting together for coffee and so on. Um, but by doing this, we know and understand very deeply where our faculty are working and the projects on which they are working which then allows us to match make. And so we'll introduce people who are working in the same um, specific geographic locale or people whose projects, um, whose research uh, aligns in some sort of way or who could be, a research could be enhanced by um, a different disciplinary perspective. So that's one of the things we spend a lot of time on. Uh, we, we found that the most successful relationships are based on projects that, and this was referred to in the previous panel, that, um, that align with um, all of the primary investigators' uh, primary research. Um, and so instead of like trying to come up with something new, we really look for existing synergies and try to bring people together based on these existing synergies. And this is important because you know, you end up with people that are much more committed to the project, committed to the relationship, um, and willing to carry their portion of the workload. And I think it also opens the door to make it more likely that the project will, the project or the um, collaboration will outlive the TIPS grant period. So again, going back to this um, conversation that we we're having about sustainability before. Uh, so one part of the relationship building we do is matchmaking. The other part is that once the relationship gets off the ground, 
We found that it's very important, and this is also time consuming, but is to sit together and to learn each other's vocabularies and to learn and to understand each other's methodologies and to essentially develop a common, a shared way to talk about the issue on which the collaboration is based. And so that's something that also takes time. Uh, I was asked to give a couple of examples of trans-institutional work that we have done uh, through class. And so my first example is Mani Plus. And this is a nutritional su supplement that it was developed to uh, target children with mal children who are suffering from malnutrition in Guatemala. And Vanderbilt has a number, we have a quite a big presence in Guatemala. We have a number of different projects that come from all over the university in Guatemala. And it all, the country has a very high rate of malnutrition. Over 50% of children in Guatemala suffer from malnutrition. And so this project was started uh, nearly 10 years ago now. And it was initially led by uh, faculty from anthropology and business. But as it grew, it really expanded to include faculty and students from across the university. And so we worked with uh, faculty in medicine and nursing to help formulate the product. We uh, engaged business students to help develop financial models and really come <coughs> up with a business plan for the distribution of the product. product. And um, we had a team of Peabody students go down to Guatemala one summer and work alongside mothers whose families were being targeted for this supplement to develop educational materials. So they worked with local mothers to develop these materials. Um, so again, engaging both graduate and undergraduate students as we heard in, in previous panels. Uh, my other example um, comes from a collaboration between a, gastroenter a gastroenterologist and an engineer who've been working together to develop a low cost endoscopy tool um, for use in rural Honduras. And so Honduras has a really high rate of gastric cancer. And so this is something that's very much in need to do screening of po rural populations at a large scale, uh, but something that's hard to do. And so we introduced these faculty to Project Pyramid, which as some of y'all may know, is a course that's housed in Owen in the business school, but that enrolls students from across the university. And so the students get together and work in multidisciplinary teams on um, economic development projects. They do it here locally, and they also do it internationally. And so we had a team of Project Pyramid students uh, go down to Honduras and work with a local nonprofit there about how this tool could be implemented within their currently existing models um, of, of community health support, which, which they're doing. And so this project is still ongoing. Um, we're hopeful that we're hopeful that they adopt this as part of their regular practice. What I think is interesting and important to mention about both of these examples is that they're, they're both international, so they show that I think trans in institutional work lends itself to international projects. I also think international projects serve as fruitful grounds for trans institutional initiatives. So they kind of go hand in hand. And they also um, show how trans institutional initiatives, and I think this again ties into these big ideas and what are we really doing and how can it be inspiring, is they're, they're being used to address um, real problems and um, being used to engage our students in service. So. Thank you, Avery. Uh, I'm George Hornberger. I, I uh, came here 10 years ago now. Uh, I'm in my 10th year. I came as the inaugural director of the Vanderbilt Institute for Energy and Environment. And uh, I'm really following up Avery to, to talk about um, basically building a community and, and how you, uh, how you and, and again, it is building relationships. One of the ways that um, VIEE, for short, uh, has done this is to host, uh, I host a weekly meeting because people recognize that it's one thing to get a group to agree to collaborate, but everyone's busy and getting everyone together uh, to discuss things is not always the easiest. So uh, I had to find a time and the only time I could find was 8 o'clock Wednesday morning when uh, people could actually make it if they so chose. Uh, and it's a, a voluntary activity. People show up if they want to. Uh, it's a, 
it's a mixture of faculty and postdocs and graduate students, undergraduate students, and also um, people from outside the university. Uh, the Southern Environmental Law Center, uh, sometimes people from Lipscomb and, and other uh, places. Um, it's not a seminar. Uh, it's not that organized. It's not that structured. Uh, we basically sit around a big table and everybody gets a chance to give an update. Uh, and it can be on anything. Uh, it could be uh, on a news article that they saw that intrigued them. It could be on an idea that they have for a paper or a proposal. And we often then have, uh, we, we'll have someone uh, and not give a full seminar but come in and uh, do what I refer to as a trial balloon where they throw out an idea and try to stimulate others to be interested. <coughs> and uh, this is what I think has worked reasonably well. Uh, for example, the, uh, the National Academies are currently doing a study on grand challenges in environmental engineering. And I was up there yesterday and they were uh, asking me about this model because they had learned about it and uh, they wanted to uh, uh, basically offer some proposals for how uh, this might work. So, uh, and, and we have people often, we, we'll have visitors come in from other universities, and they're uniformly, uh, I, I, well, maybe amazed isn't too strong a word, but they would like to bottle it and take it home to their own universities. And I tell them that I have no prescription for bottling it, but for an and, just to, to tell you that I think it is successful. This is a note that was passed around by a graduate student who is going on to do something else now. And, um, she distributed at the VIE meeting at 8 o'clock this past Wednesday. Dear VIE, thank you for an incredible five years. Our discussions have not only increased my general awareness of neat research, but have also helped chart my growth as an interdisciplinary researcher, communicator, an informed citizen. Let's be honest, the three-minute thesis competition was a walk <laughs> in the park after the VIE trial balloon. <laughs> Great. Great. Uh, thanks so much for, for setting the tone here. I'm Liz Sechmeister. I direct the Latin American Public Opinion Project. I'm also a faculty member in political science. And the Latin American Public Opinion Project is also called LAWPOP by its <coughs> initials. It's a grant-driven research center that specializes in international survey research or public opinion research that we sort of consider policy relevant. Now my colleagues in political science don't like me saying that because they say everything we do is policy relevant, so how does that distinguish you at all? But by that I mean that we tend to collaborate with members of the international development community, policymakers, um, the United States Agency for International Development, international development banks in the region, the, the United Nations Development Program, um, and governments across the, the Americas and, and beyond. Um, the, the center sprung up at Vanderbilt in 2004 before I arrived here, uh, and it's grown over the, the years. I arrived in, in 2008. Uh, at that time, it was still a fairly small center uh, with very little in terms of staff support, uh, but a pretty active research program. Uh, graduate students were involved, but we didn't have any undergraduate students involved. And we've grown to uh, the point where we have eight professional research staff working with us full time, 15 affiliated graduate students, about 30 undergraduate student researchers involved each year uh, with us in different ways. Um, and a number of different collaborations and connections of faculty uh, across the campus. And so uh, in thinking about how, how we grown to this point, uh, to, the, to the size that we're at and, and the sort of uh, degree of, of robustness that we, that we can demonstrate, um, for us it's, it's all these things, uh, but also money, right? Uh, so we've been able to grow uh, in these ways because we've been competing uh, in, in different competitions for more projects and more support along the way, with that support coming from a diverse set of, of sources. So sources on campus, um, government funding, uh, these funding sources like the United States Agency for National Development, but also the National Science Foundation uh, and others, uh, funding from the international development community, um, foundation funds, 
funds that come in from collaborations with other scholars outside of Vanderbilt. So mm -hmm. we've, we've taken Ford Foundation money that someone else has <laughs> secured at another institution and we brought it here to apply it to our research project after demonstrating that we could sort of do something um, better in terms of realizing a return for that individual in their research project than they could do on their on their own. So by collaborating with us, they would get a bigger <coughs> bang for their buck, and we brought the, the money here and supported the project. Um, and of course, with support from, from Vanderbilt. Um, so so how, how does one get money? Um, uh, the way I think about this is that successful centers return many different types of, of sort of um, outputs, uh, value adds uh, across many different dimensions. And that's important because, well, so for two reasons. One, it makes the center more robust to shortcomings in any given one area, right? So um, maybe that you have a great idea uh, for, for, for something to pan out and be the core of your center. Well, what's your plan B, right? So we always have a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, and we're, we're actively pursuing them. So it's not that we're pursuing one at a time, but we're trying to realize successes in multiple areas um, at, at, as many, like, in as many different ways as we can. And the other reason that that's important is that it allows you to make different cases to different funding institutions, because different funding institutions care about different, different things. Um, a successful center has to constantly justify its value to those who support it. And so successful centers seize on opportunities to make a difference and they document and we document and document and document and report on, on successes. Um, I have had to recognize over the years that what I prioritize or value in a research project or in a center is not always what others find the most interesting or the most um, valuable uh, part of it. And that's okay because there are like, you know, these multiple rewards that we can, we can realize from centers. Um, so I thought I would just quickly say a few things that I think we've done that, that have been successful along the way. Uh, one is that we expanded our undergraduate involvement. So as I mentioned, when I arrived here in 2008, there was no undergraduate involvement in the research center. That seemed to be a loss uh, from my own perspective because I recognized the undergraduate students here as terrific, and they are. So they're incredibly valuable, um, but by, by engaging them, then we, get, we gain a value added, right? So we can justify ourselves along that dimension to the, to the university when we apply for internal funding. Um, we continue to engage graduate students, of course, we care about that as well here. We've also extended ourselves as a resource to the rest of the campus community. And so I will take the opportunity to plug this. We are a survey research institute. So for faculty who are working on external grant proposals or projects where you need help with questionnaire design, sample design, field work, analysis, we do all of this uh, and, we're, and we're pretty good at it. Uh, so, um, so we uh, engage in collaborations with, with others where the research that we're doing is not ours but theirs and we're uh, a support uh, input into it. So those are two ways that um, we've, I think, been able to enhance our value <coughs> on campus. In terms of thinking about uh, external uh, funding sources, as I mentioned, we've sort of meticulously tracked the ways in which we have an impact. Uh, so we take care to track uh, use of our data and outputs, use of our data in dissertations, references to our data or reports in publications, publications that we generate here, publications that are generated elsewhere, uh, any type of report. Um, website hits, so you can get Vanderbilt's uh, webcom to center to uh, give you the analytics on your project's website. So we track those and, and keep those on hand so we can put them into reports. We track media mentions. Uh, we built out a social media platform to have over 4,000 followers on Twitter. That's been really helpful to us because we are this center that engages with the policymaking world. So in the past month, we've had the executive uh, office, the, the executive branch in the Dominican Republic mention our project on Twitter. Uh, congressmen in Peru mention our project on Twitter. Uh, in the media, we, and in circulating social media, we had the former foreign affairs minister from Mexico mention the project. Th these people are all on Twitter. I'm not active on Twitter. 
um, but our center is. Uh, so, so that's been very helpful to us. Uh, and it's been really helpful to demonstrate our value to foundations, right? Because they want some type of heuristic, some type of, of cue or, or, or proof that you are relevant out there in the policy community. Uh, and that's been, that's been one way that we've been able to do that. So just to, to say that in terms of looking for, for funding and thinking about it, um, don't just think about the different types of funding sources are at, that are out there, but also the different ways that you can build value added into your project in many different ways so that you can find these different ways to appeal and document from the, from the initial you know, step one all of these different ways that you might have impact so that you can show growth in each of those categories over time. That's actually really important. So one of the things that I had a note <coughs> that's in my notes that I didn't bring uh, was to mention the word metrics. Mm -hmm. Metrics, metrics, metrics. Mm -hmm. and a lot of times during the reviews we see these great ideas and we don't know how the investigators or team um, are going to measure their success. And so when you leverage what you've done with your TIPS proposal for additional funding later, later on, those metrics become incredibly important. I think Liz just did a, a terrific job of summarizing some very important tangible metrics. Yeah. And I would just add to that, um, it, there, we get so many proposals where they really haven't tried to think through how, how what, what actual gauges of success would be. And so people will say dopey things like, we'll count how many people are going to come to our center. <coughs> so one person coming is a count, right? What, what does that mean to us, right? How is that a measure for success? So spend a little time actually thinking through what will be satisfying, meaningful, visible measures of success. You have to assume that you're going to be funded. You have to play to win as opposed to playing not to lose. And when you play to win and you include metrics like this and you're telling us that you're confident that this thing's got legs in the, in the long run. Mm -hmm. We've got plenty of time for Q&A, so. My notes. So, is it is it genuinely true that we're questioned out? <laughs> Anything that any of the panel participants would want to throw in, having listened to everybody else speak? It may be that we're done. You've got a this question? Is, I have it done on my homework. Is there a, a library of the? Proposals from the funded tips available, or just the descriptions? Is there a library? All right. Do you mean like the full proposal itself, or um, we don't typically post the full proposals themselves? Um, if you are interested in looking at one that is well developed, we will reach out to um, a faculty member and ask if they are comfortable with us sending that on to anyone, but. We don't typically post them because they have things in them, like their budgets, which we don't try and advertise. Right, right, right. Sorry, yeah. without the budget. Yeah. And I'm imagining most people would be happy to share. Yeah, usually when we ask, they're happy to help anyone out and have that. Like Part of what's so much fun about this is how it builds collaboration. Any other questions? This may not be relevant to anybody else, and if that's the case, then I will talk to someone offline. But um, we were in the situation where the council um, invited us to combine our proposal with another proposal, mm -hmm. and um, and I'm wondering a little bit about how that, if that changes some of the rules or the processes of the application. Um, if that's only relevant to me, then I'll talk to somebody about it directly. I'm happy to yeah. talk with you. Um, Okay, great. Any other questions? 
So if we're ending now, let me just reiterate that you should feel free to reach out to people in the tips, through the tips email, to people on the council. If we don't know the answer to your question, we're happy to get you in touch with people who will. Um, this is genuinely exciting for us. We are not reading these negatively. We are not looking to strike people out. Um, and, and we really are excited to watch people develop generative projects that will bring distinction to Vanderbilt and make Vanderbilt a more exciting place to work. So um, don't hesitate to reach out if you've got questions. Thank you very much. Oh, there you go. <laughs>